Okay, good morning class. This is the video for section 2.2 functions. And so we're going to get into some of the basics with functions, um, specifically the notation and um, definition of domain, and then eventually some algebraic manipulation with um, some expressions called the difference quotients. So let's go ahead and jump right into it. So um, Many everyday phenomenon involve two quantities that are related to each other by some rule of correspondence. The mathematical term for such a rule of correspondence is a relation. So in mathematics, equations and formulas often re represent relations. For instance, the simple interest I earned on $1,000 for one year is related to the annual interest rate by the formula I equal to 1,000 times R. And so when you're talking about relations, you're actually talking about um, the multiplication, division, addition, subtraction, um, exponents applied, radicals applied, but something is happening to the numbers of this function. Um, that is creating that relationship between the two variables, okay? So then the formula I equal to 1000 R represents a special kind of relationship that matches each item from one set with exactly one item from a different set. Such a relation is called a function. The definition of a function is a function f from a set A to a set B is a relation that assigns to each element x in the set A exactly one element y in the set B. The set A is the domain or the set of inputs of the function, and the set B is the range or the set of outputs. So basically, if you draw images here, it says, to help understand this definition, look at the function below which relates the time of day to the temperature. So it has the times of day in PM, 1 PM, 2 PM, 3 PM, 4 PM, 5 PM, and then 6 PM. So the domain of all the elements of this set are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. The set they're calling set A. And so all of these values are just 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Now over here in this second set, notice that you have a bunch of different numbers um, these are all the possible temperatures, but notice that one is mapped specifically to the number nine, two specifically mapped to 13, four to 15, three to 15, five to 12, and six to 10, okay? This set, okay, um, although it has many possibilities, only the ones that were actually mapped to someone in the first set are actual outputs, okay? And so the range here is the set of outputs. And the only outputs we had in numerical order were 9, 10, 12, 13, and 15. So um, the following ordered pairs can be represented by this function. Um, the first coordinate is the x value is the input. And the second coordinate, which is the y value, is the output. So if we took every one of those mappings, one went to nine, two went to 13, three to 15, four also to 15, five to 12 and six to 10. So the characteristics of a function from the first set, all the first guys to set B, all the second uh, components, each element in A must be matched with an element, an element in B, okay? Some elements in B may not be matched with any element in A. We saw that in the graph. Um, two or more elements in A may be matched with the same element in B. An element in A, the domain, cannot be matched with two different elements in B. So you can have, um, like, for instance, this situation. You can have three mapped to 15 and four mapped to 15. But what you can't have is you can't have the same first component. So let's say I had another three and then had a different component other than 15. Let's say I had another component of 11, okay? 
um, this cannot happen. This element would make this whole function not a function. So notice that the y values can repeat, but the x values cannot repeat. So that's essentially the definition of a function is where the x values cannot repeat. Four common ways to represent functions are as follows. One is verbally, using a sentence that describes how the input variable is related to the output variable. Two is numerically, by a table or a list of ordered pairs that matches input values with output values. Three, graphically, by points on a graph in a coordinate plane in which the horizontal axis represents the input values and then the vertical axis represents the output values or for algebraically by an equation in two variables. So it says to determine whether a relation is a function, you must decide whether each input value is matched with exactly one output value. When any input value is matched with two or more output values, the relation is not a function. And visually, this is for graphs only. Okay, the vertical line test concludes that an image represents the graph of a function if and only if no vertical line that you imagine to be there um, intersects it more than once. Okay, so I'll give you some examples in a little bit. But first it says, determine whether the relation represents y as a function of x. So for part A, it says the input value x is the number of representatives from a state. And the output value y is the number of senators. Now, the second example is where they have input values and output values listed on a table. This is um, the same but the inputs and the outputs are described using a graph. And so here we go. Now it says, um, the solution, A, this verbal description does describe Y as a relationship, um, as a function of X. Regardless of the value X, the value of Y is always two. Such, such um, variables is called um, constant functions. So remember, x was, um, the inputs were, the input value x is the number of representatives from a state. So I don't know how many number of representatives you can have, some, rep some of them have one, two, or three, right? Depending on what the state is maybe even different values, um, but they all, each state only has two senators regardless, okay? So it didn't matter what the X value was, the Y value was always two, okay? And that's what it's saying here is that um, regardless of the, X, the value of X, the value of Y is always two, okay? And those are considered functions. If I graph this, one and two is here, two and two is here, three and two is right there. And if I apply that vertical line test, meaning I imagine an infinite number of vertical lines everywhere, and none of these vertical lines will intersect my graph, my graph being these three dots, none of those lines intersect the graph more than once, okay? So this one is a function. Now, for um, part B, the table does not describe a, a y as a function of x. If you notice in the table, you have two going to 11, but then you also have two going to 10 in that table, okay? And when that happens, we told you that the same x value cannot go to two different y values. So this one is not a function, okay? Now, the last one has a graph, and the graph does not describe y as a function of x. If we go look at the image of the graph according to the vertical line test, let's look at it. If I imagine a bunch of vertical lines drawn in this graph, right? I mean, a million of them, I can draw them forever, right? 
But notice that each one only touches the graph once or none, right? But none, none of these lines touch the graph more than once, okay? And so this one is the graph um, of a function. So it does describe the graph of the function. And so does the first one. Now, and if you were to graph the second one, okay, let's just talk about B for a second. If you were to graph it, you would have two, and then let's say 11's way up here. Then you would have um, two again and 10. Then you would have three and eight. Then you would have four and five, and then five and one. Okay, and if you notice, if I draw a vertical line, Anywhere over here is fine. I only go through the graph once, but if I draw a vertical line right there, it automatically goes through it twice, okay? And that's also another reason ver visually why um, the second option was not a function. Okay, so for function notation, representing functions by sets of order pairs is common in what we call discrete mathematics where you only have a set number of inputs and a set number of outputs, okay? However, in algebra, is more common to represent functions by equations. Just because you could type in, your sets can then become infinite. So you can type in an infinite number of inputs and you have like a formula to calculate what those outputs would be, okay? Um, if you do write it as a function of x, um, this is just a specific example, x squared, okay? But it does represent y as a function of the variable x. And in this situation, x is considered the independent variable and y is considered the dependent variable because you'll calculate y depending on what the x value for x is, okay? And I don't know if it's clear, but this should be an equal sign. I think the printer did not make that evident. Okay, now the domain of the function is the set of all the values taken on by the independent variable x, and the range of the function is the set of all values taken on by the dependent variable y. So when using an equation to represent a function, it's convenient to name the function for easy reference. For example, um, you know that the equation y equals one minus x squared describes y as a function of x. Suppose you give this function in the name f, then you can use the following function notation. You can say f of x because f is a function of x, just like y is a function of x. Okay, so the parentheses let you say of. So this is said as f of x, okay? And it's more like a little squiggly line because it's not an actual f, it's like a function f, right? Um, and then you, instead of writing y equals one minus x squared, you write f of x equals one minus x squared. So you can have any name, it doesn't have to be f. It could be g, it could be g of x. And then you have a different name, g of x equals this function. You could have h of x, l of x, i of x, w of x. It doesn't really matter what letter you put it, it's just a name, okay? It comes in handy when you're talking about more than one function, right? If we have y equals, that's great. That helps me describe one function. But if I have two functions in my problem and you call them both y, how do we distinguish when I'm referring to one, how do I distinguish whether I'm talking about the first equation or the second equation if they're both called y, right? You have to have names that way you can refer to those functions when you need to call on them. So the symbol f of x is read as the value of f at x or simply f of x. The symbol f parentheses x corresponds to the y value for a given x. So another way to remember that is that y is just the, or f of x is just a fancy way of saying y, okay? Keep in mind that f is the name of the function, whereas f of x is the value of the function at a specific x value. 
For instance, the function f of x equals three minus two x has the function values denoted by f of negative one, f of zero, f of two, and so on. To find these values, you substitute the specific specified input into the given equation. So for x equal to negative one, you would plug in negative one for x, you would do your computations here, and then this is the output, this is your y value, okay? Which is why you would get the point negative one for x and five for y, okay? For x equal to zero, the x value is now zero, so you plug in zero for x, you do your computations, and this is your y value, which then gives you the coordinates of zero for x and three for y. And then finally, for the last one, for x equal to two, that's what's in the parentheses. So we know x is equal to two. You plug in two for x, you do your competition, computation, and then this turns out to be your y value, which gives you the point form of two comma negative one. And then now you have your outputs, okay? Although f is often used as a convenient function name, and x is often used as the independent variable, you can use other letters, okay? So you may have functions that have the name f, but are in terms of x, right? You may have functions that are named f, but are in terms of t. You may have functions that are named g in terms of s, okay? All of these define the same function because if you notice, they're all doing the same computations. All of them are squaring an x value then subtracting four times that input, and then adding seven to that, to that input, to that calculation, okay? So they're all the same function. Um, the role of the independent variable is that of a placeholder, really. It's basically your formula to how to calculate the outputs. So consequently, a function could be described using blanks or boxes or any shape, really, just to signify that whatever the input is, you have a function or a um, formula to follow to get the output, okay? Now, here's something a little bit different. Excuse me. It says a function defined by two or more equations over a specified domain is called a piece defined, piecewise defined function. So here's an example of what a piecewise defined function looks like. It says evaluate the function when x equals negative one, zero, and one. And it has this function divided or described in two, it's defined in two different equations, okay? So you'll use this top equation when your inputs are less than zero, and you'll use this bottom function to get your y values when your inputs are greater than or equal to zero. So really when you're reading your problems, you're gonna to have to first figure out what X value you're gonna plug in, decide which function you're gonna plug it into, and then you may plug it in to actually calculate that output, okay? So for the first one, for X equal to negative one, we know that negative one is less than zero. So we're talking about this specific condition, and that means we would be using this specific function, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna plug the X value negative one into the formula to calculate the output. So it becomes negative one squared plus one. Well, negative one squared is one. And then one plus one is where they get two, okay? So for X equal to zero, well, we know that if x is equal to zero, it's going to be in this bottom condition because this one says not only is x greater than zero, but also x can equal zero. So I would be plugging it into this function. So now I'm gonna replace the x with zero minus one, we get negative one. And so the point here for this part would be negative one for x and two for y. The point corresponding to this information would be zero for x and then negative one for y. Two and negative one have been my output so far. Now for the last one, for x equal to one, one is greater than zero. So I am still talking about this same function. So if I plug one into that function, we end up with the y value of zero. 
So this becomes um, one was my input and my output was zero. Now, here we have the domain of a function. So it says the domain of a function can be described explicitly or it can be implied by the expression used to define the function. The implied domain is the set of all real numbers for which the expression is defined. For instance, the function f of x equals one over x squared minus four has an implied domain consisting of all real x rather other than x equal to positive or negative two, okay? The domain should exclude any x values that result in division by zero. Because we know if we divide by zero, we will get undefined in our calculator. So anything that will make the denominator zero is not going to be in the domain of the function, okay? And like it says, these two values are excluded from the domain because division by zero is undefined. Okay, so if I were to plug in a two here or a negative two, when I square that two or negative two, I'm gonna get positive four. And then four take away four is going to give me one over zero. And we know that this is not defined, okay? The only two numbers that will cause me to get this zero downstairs is two and negative two. And how would I know that? You could figure that out by taking your denominator and setting it equal to zero and solving that equation to figure out what those X values are gonna be to exclude from the domain. So in this instance, you could either extract roots or you could factor, but in any case, you're gonna end up with X equal to positive or negative two, okay? Now, another common type of implied domain is that used to avoid even roots of negative numbers. For example, the function, the square root of X. Now this doesn't apply for cube roots or fifth roots or any odd roots, because we know we can take the odd root of a negative number. It only applies when the index there is even, okay? And for our implied domain, domains are always gonna exclude X values that make, that result in negative, um, that result in even roots of negative numbers. So that means we need to ensure that the radicand, whatever's on the inside, is greater than or equal to zero. We need to make sure that it's not negative, okay? And we already learned in a previous section that this um, inequality can be written in interval notation, and that interval notation would be zero to infinity with the bracket on zero. In general, the domain of a function excludes values that would cause division by zero, or that would result in the even root of a negative number. So we have two implied um, domains, okay? So we have two bits of information about implied domains. So here's um, an example. It says, find the domain of each function. Here you've got a list of um, points. Here you have actual function in function notation. Here you also have, um, a function given to you with the relationship described with V and R as our variables. And then you have another function using H as its name, but both of these are functions in X. So let's discuss their domains. The domain of F um, consists of all first coordinates in the set of the ordered pairs. So the domain would be all of the X values, negative three, negative one, zero, two, and four. And that's what they got there, okay? Now for part B, excluding X values that yield zero in the denominator. So notice it's a fraction. So we have to see what happens when this guy equals zero. Well, if I solve that, it's going to equal zero when X is equal to negative five. So I'm going to have to exclude that X equal to negative five um, from the domain. Therefore, the domain of G is the set of all real numbers except when X is equal to negative five, okay? And then for part C, notice that C is this function here, okay? It says, um, because this function represents the volume of the sphere, the values of the radius must be positive by definition, okay? So the domain is the set of all real numbers 
such that r is greater than zero. Your radius can't equal zero because then it's not actually a circle, okay? It's just a, a point which has no volume and no um, area. So let's look at D. D was the radical, okay? And it says this function has is defined only when the x values of the inside are um, greater than or equal to zero. So remember, you cannot take the square root of a negative. So you need to ensure that whatever is inside there is either positive, greater than zero, or equal to zero. It just cannot be negative. And if I solve this, right, if I subtract four on both sides, I'll end up with negative three x greater than or equal to negative four. And then if I divide both sides by three, I'm gonna get a positive four thirds. And because I divided by a negative, this is gonna flip over. And so you end up with this expression, which we know that that inequality can be written as an interval. And so the domain becomes this interval. Now, one thing is to be said that in example 3C, know that the domain of a function may be implied by the physical context, okay? For instance, in this equation that they gave us, you would have no reason to restrict R to just positive values. I mean, you can plug in any number and cube it, multiply it by another number, multiply it by a fraction, and you will always get an output, okay? So my restriction on the radius had nothing to do with where this function was defined or where it was undefined. However, when you put the physical context into perspective, then you know that you cannot have a radius logistically, geometrically, right? You cannot have a radius equal to zero or a radius equal to a negative, okay? And so that's what created our restriction on our domain for that problem. So you have to both consider the mathematical context and then also the physical context. So time can never be negative, lengths, Measure, measurements can never be negative. Um, as far as like links and areas and, vo and volumes are concerned, um, later we will get into, um, you can have temperatures that are negative, right? Um, just not time or measurements of length and radius, stuff like that, or volume or area. Okay, so. Here we get into what are called difference quotients. So um, we know a function is a relationship between two variables such that um, to each value of the independent variable, there corresponds exactly one value of the dependent variable. We also talked about the function notation, f of x, and we know that f is the name, y is the dependent variable, x is the independent variable, and f of x is basically the y value of the function at x. Okay. Now, one of these basic definitions and one of the basic definitions in calculus employs the ratio f of x plus h minus f of x over h. This ratio is called the difference quotient. Um, the domain of a function is the set of all values or inputs of the independent variable for which the function is defined. If X is the domain of F, then F is said to be defined at X. If X is not in the domain of F, then F is said to be undefined as X. The range of a function is the set of all values or outputs assumed by the dependent variable that is the set of all function values. Implied domain. If F is defined by an algebraic expression and the domain is not specified, then the implied domain consists of all real numbers for which the expression is defined. So here's our first example using a difference quotient. It gives us a function, its name is F, okay? And here is how they describe F in terms of X. Now they're telling us to find this ratio, F of X plus H minus F of X over H. So what they're going to do is they're going to replace x, okay? So here's x, here's my function, here's what I'm going to plug in, and then when you plug it in, you're going to plug it in here, and you're going to plug it in there, okay? 
So right now, what we're going to be plugging in is we're going to be plugging in x plus h. So I'm going to plug in x plus h to be squared minus 4. And then I'm going to be plugging in x plus h and then plus 7. And that consists of everything in that first box. So this first box is this f of x plus h. Okay. Now there's the minus, and in the second spot, they decided to use just parentheses, is just the original f of x, okay? So the original f of x, which is x squared minus 4x plus 7. And then this whole thing over um, h. And so what we're going to do here is we're going to square this. So I, in class, I showed you guys, and I think I even discussed it in one of the videos on how to shortcut this product here. You are doing x plus h times another x plus h. So when you foil it all out, you end up with x squared and h squared, and then 2 times x times h, which is this 2xh in the middle. Okay. Here, if I distribute the negative 4, that's where they have negative 4x and negative 4h. And here they distributed the negative to everyone, and they got negative x squared, positive 4x, and negative h. Then what they did is they combined like terms. So they noticed that x squared and x squared will cancel, negative 4x, positive 4x cancel, 7 and negative 7 also cancel. And so what are they left with? They're left with 2xh, the plus h squared, and the minus 4h. Then they noticed that everybody in the numerator had an h, so they factored out that h. And with the h being out, the first term is 2x, this is now just h, and this is now just minus 4. And so then this h will cancel with the other h in the bottom, leaving you with the expression 2x plus h minus 4. And so this is as much as you can simplify it, since none of these are like terms, OK? Now remember, you did have h in the denominator, and we know that our denominators cannot equal 0. So right off the bat, this only exists when h is not equal to zero, okay? So let's go ahead and get into our practice problems. It says, determine whether the equation represents uh, y as a function of x. Now, if you try to solve for y, um, the first thing I would have to do is minus the x squared over. So I'd get positive y squared equal four minus x squared. Then the next thing I would need to do is I would need to take the square root of both sides. Now, when you do that, you're going to immediately have plus or minus. So then you end up with just y equal to plus or minus the square root of 4 minus x squared. Um, and because of that plus or minus, when I plug in an x value, immediately I'm going to get a positive and a negative y value. Okay. So what does that mean? That means that this one is not a function. It doesn't matter what I plug in for x. When I square it and I subtract 4, as long as it's defined, I'm still going to get two values for y. So I plugged in 1x, whatever it is, but I end up with plus a y value and a negative y value, okay, which breaks the definition of a function. Now. This one says determine the equation represents a function of x. This one does, because no matter what I plug in, I don't get plus or minus. I just get the positive, right? This one had a radical already in it, so I do not force the plus or minus in there. If it's positive, it's positive. And if it had a negative in front, then it was negative, OK? So this one already is um, one value. When I plug in an x here, I will only get one y value back out. Now. It can be possible that I can plug in two different x's and get the same y value, but that's not what defines a function. It's when you plug in the same x and you get two y's. That is what makes a function not a function. So this one is a function. And then here we have um, the function value is defined as this. Um, the only one I would be concerned with is um, what happens at zero. 
Well, no, not even then. So this is a function because you'll basically have a graph that at zero is two, and then it goes in this direction. And then you have one that's at five, but then it's going in this direction. And so if you notice, look at that, it passes the vertical line test. Oh, this one should have an open back. And I'll explain that when we get to this section, but uh, where we actually graph. We haven't graphed these yet, but this would pass the vertical line test. The only spot in question would be right on top of the y-axis, but there's only a point here. There's no point here. So it does, it does only intersect it once. So this one is a function. You'll never have a single X value with two different Y values. And then now here, this is just a list of, um, it says find the function value if possible. So F of negative one, well, negative one is less than zero. So I would plug this into this formula. So it would be five times negative one plus two, which is negative three. So that means F of negative one equals negative three. For part A, um, the X value is now zero. X is equal to zero means I follow this bottom function. So I'll do five times zero plus five, which gives me five. So F of zero is five. And then finally F of two, two is greater than zero. So I'm gonna plug two into that bottom equation and I get 10 plus five. So 15 is F of two. And that's it. So they didn't really ask me if this was a function or not, probably because we haven't learned how to graph them yet. Now, practice four says find the domain of the function. Okay, so we know that our denominators cannot equal zero. So I know that X cannot equal zero and I know that X plus five cannot equal zero. So that tells me that X cannot equal zero and X cannot equal negative five. So my domain is gonna be all real numbers except X equal to zero and negative five. Now the domain of part five is interesting because I know that this cannot equal zero, but I also know that the inside of an even radical must be greater than or equal to zero. And if I solve both of these functions for X, let's see what we get. So over here, I would have to square both sides and I would get six minus X cannot equal still zero. And then if I add X on both sides, I get this statement, which can be also written like this. So X cannot equal six. And then if I solve this one, I would have um, negative X greater than or equal to negative six by minusing six. And then if I divide by negative one, I get X and positive six, but this would have to flip over because I divided by a negative. So I get X has to be less than or equal to six. Now, if you put these two statements together, Okay, this one is saying X has to be less than or equal. And this one is saying that X cannot equal six. So if you put those two statements together, it's basically gonna wipe six out the, the picture. So basically X has to be strictly less than six. So what would be your domain if I write it in intervals? Here in intervals, interval is gonna be very interesting because here you have zero or negative five, here you have zero and you can't include this, this problem. So there's like a big hole right there and you can't include zero. So there's like a big hole right there. So your interval is actually that section, the middle section, and then this section over here. So what does that look like? It looks like negative infinity to negative five. It's not included because there's a hole at negative five. So you use a parentheses. Then the middle section is negative five to zero. And then the right side section is from zero to positive infinity. And so that would be the domain in intervals. Over here, X is less than six. So if you mark six, less than six would be in that direction. And so in the interval, that would be from negative infinity to the six. And since I do not have a bar here, it would be a parentheses, okay? And so that's how you would write both of those domains in interval notation. Now we have one last question and that is the difference quotient. 
So it says, find the difference quotient for this function and simplify your answer. So our difference fo function is going to be um, f of x plus h minus f of x over h. So first I'm gonna plug in x plus h. So I have five times x plus h minus x plus h squared, and then minus the original function, five x minus x squared, all over h. So first I'll distribute my five, I get 5x plus 5h. Here I'm going to have minus x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. And then I'm going to distribute this minus. So minus 5x plus x squared all over h. Now I do see that 5x and minus 5x will cancel. But I am going to distribute this negative. So 5h minus x squared minus 2xh minus h squared plus x squared all over h. So I do know that now these x squareds will cancel and all three of the terms remaining do have an h. So I'm going to factor out that h and end up with five minus two x minus h. And then now the h on the top and the h at the bottom will cancel. And I'm left with five minus two x minus h. Now remember you did have h in the denominator at the beginning. So you always have that implied domain that H cannot equal zero. But this is what they'll want you to type in on your computer, okay? But that is the end of 2.2.